But I'm going to introduce to you someone who's, I met him for the first time about a year ago and become a hero. It's someone who's just stepped out and taken risks in God and taken adventures. And we've got a real life adventurer with us today. And he's going to come, and I know, just inspire and empower you to be risk takers and adventurous people in the kingdom of God as well. So at the back, there's a book, a biography that someone's written about his life uh, that is just full of just adventures and risk taking that you will love. But please, would you put your hands together and give a big River Church welcome to our guest today, Tom Hamlin. <laughs> Brother, give me a hug. I didn't expect that. Lovely to see you. Tom you. shared at our men's breakfast yesterday morning, and wasn't it amazing, guys? Just such a blessing. So, Tom, thank you for being with us today. Thank you, Mark. Thank you to your wife, Edna, for releasing you for the day to be with us as well. Thank you. And, Tom, we're all yours. It's over to you. Thank God bless you. you. Thank you very much. I would like that little table if it's available. Oh, here it is. It's, it's come. Yeah. Well, that was a quick answer to my prayer. I'm delighted to be here. I feel so privileged to be here. Truly, I do. And I'm only sorry that my precious, darling wife is not with me. She was to be with me, but she'd been very ill of recent. And um, in fact, so ill, I thought she was going to go to heaven. But she's in recovery and she's doing well. She's had a hard year this year so far. She was attacked in our home in January. I was in Northern Ireland for five days doing ministry. And a man forced the door open and stabbed her. And um, she, was, uh, she was injured. And of course, um, she had such courage, even in that situation, for she thought it was the postman had come in. And, uh, and she was able to suddenly reach out and pull off his hood and his mask across his face, and she knew who it was. He was sentenced last week. It's taken all this time for his sentence. He was sentenced last week, and he's got six years. And yet God revealed to me more than six weeks ago that when he goes to prison, I am to visit him. Because I believe he's, he's one who should be in the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ and his family too, because his family is, is a mess. But wasn't, wasn't we all mess before we came to Jesus? My life was a t total mess. And as for risks, I personally think that Pastor Mark and his lovely Nita have taken great risk today in inviting me here. <laughs> That's, that's, that's risk living, all right. I want to introduce you before I open up the word and I share with you many things of, uh, uh, of God's wonderful, amazing doings and dealings and deliverances and delights in the Muslim nations, 11 Muslim nations, of which uh, for the past 16 years we've been going in with the Word of God. Not in fives and tens or one hundreds of copies, but in thousands. And we've done it all transparently and, and openness, so nobody could say we smuggled. A lot of Christians get excited on the word smuggled, God smuggled. No, I've never been God's smuggler. I've been a courier of God's Word. I've carried hundreds of kilos through customs and immigration in 11 Muslim countries. I've been arrested, of course, several times. I've been detained. I've caused the British embassies some problems at times. But I've done no wrong. I've done no wrong. And God knows that. So I'd like to introduce you to the one God gave me 49 years ago. We've been married together. I had my first kiss when she was 17, and uh, she was unexpecting it, you see. I caught her unawares. <laughs> and the reason was the dog was holding her like this, and it was a most wonderful opportunity. <laughs> so I stepped forward, and I put a gentle kiss on her lips, and then she looked at me, and she said, Tom, what did you mean by that? And I said, well, I mean, well, love, I love you. And, 
I've loved you for a long time. That's why I kissed you. I love you. Tom, she said, I will not make my kisses cheap. I will keep, I will keep my kisses for the man that God will give me for the rest of my life. That nearly bowled me over. I wanted to scream, I am the man! <laughs> you know. However, we married at 20, and uh, we've had a glorious time together. She's been such a wonderful, faithful wife. Here's my Edna. Her smile at customs has been very valuable. <laughs> With that lovely smile of hers, and then when she said, Salaam Alaikum, in such a lovely, gentle way, you know. And then the, sometimes they've answered, Alaikum Salaam, and other times they've said, and that means scanner, go through the scanner with what you've got in your trolley, and so on. She's been amazing. Thank you for giving me this opportunity, Mark. Thank you, you men that were at the men's breakfast yesterday. And I thank you because of your openness as well. I'm going to read a portion of scripture, and then I shall launch in after this to some of the things that God has done. But I believe this is a scripture. It's the scripture that brought me to Christ when I first heard it. After being in a broken family for years and home and so on, after being in juvenile courts and after a messed up young life, I heard this read and God spoke immediately to my heart and he, he took away the veil of darkness from my mind and from my heart. He opened my eyes to see the glory of the Savior, the Son of God. And I came broken to him, but oh, how wonderful. So I'm reading this portion of scripture, which I think will be shown on the screen for you. It is from first, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and I'm picking it up from verse 14. Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves but for him who died for them and was raised again. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in that way, we do so no longer. You see, the world has this worldly view of Jesus Christ. They have him historically, that he was a man of history. He was here. So they have him historically. They also have him ethically. Some of the things that he said, the Beatitudes, Nothing compares with the Beatitudes in any other religious book in the world except the Bible. And that Beatitudes, his teaching, is so wonderful, it affects non-Christians of all kinds of religions when they hear it. So ethically, they, they recognize that, historically. But then it comes also to thirdly, and that is practically. They accept him. Yes, he was a man of history. Yes, he did that. Yes, he was practical. He healed the sick. He raised the dead. He fed the hungry. I think it was one MP in Westminster Parliament who actually said, and he was wrong in saying it, of course, but he did say Jesus Christ was the first communist. I don't know what he was trying to get across to the rest of the house at that time. That was many years ago. But he was wrong, because Jesus Christ was the savior of the world. He loved the world. Communism didn't love the world. They wanted to take the world. You know, so we read this from here. We, we had a worldly view of him. We once regarded him in history and in other ways, but we do so no, no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. And all this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us this ministry of reconciliation. And I have that ministry. 
because he gave it to me. From the moment I was redeemed, born of the Spirit, made anew, a new creation, from that very moment he had given me the message of reconciliation, which I'm still proclaiming wherever I go. And all this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us this ministry of reconciliation. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting men's sins against them. He has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God was making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. And if you're not if there's anyone here today and you're not reconciled to God, you don't know him personally, you only know him historically or ethically or practically. If you're not born and you don't know him personally with a relationship, make this day your day of salvation. Make this day your day of reconciliation. Because God loves you. Christ died for you. He loves you to be one with him and enjoy him. He's such a marvelous Savior God. We're blessed, aren't we blessed? Amen. And then God made him, Jesus, who had no sin, to be sin for us. So that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Isn't that amazing? I spoke to the men yesterday morning on that. That this righteousness which has come through Christ to us. It's not self-righteousness. It's not something you work up. Self-righteousness. No. Self-righteousness stinks in the nostrils of God. It's as filthy rags. No. This righteousness is pure. This righteousness is the righteousness of God. It's in imputed when you believe in Christ it's imputed and then it's imparted every day of your life you're imparting the righteousness of Christ not self-righteousness so now let me give you a quick um, background after we married at the age of 20 I had served my two years in the British Army National Service in Singapore Malaya came home we married then we went in to serve as evangelists to Her Majesty's British Army and Air Force. And we were in that for 15 years, thereabouts, evangelizing uh, the tribes of Her Majesty's forces. <laughs> we had some hairy experiences, but we had glorious experiences too. After that, the Lord led us very clearly in a most wonderful way. We were in a day of prayer and fasting, and God spoke to us with another brother who was there in the room as well. We used to spend this day every week before God for the, through the day. And then uh, the Lord spoke to both my wife and myself a decade for Borneo. A decade, 10 years. A decade for Borneo. So we served the tribal people in Borneo in Asia for 10 years, deep in the jungles. We went to the animist tribes and we went to the former headhunting tribes and the Christian tribes as well. Of course, as many Christians too in the jungles of Borneo, under pressure, I might tell you, under pressure from powers elsewhere. But they're precious people. We served that 10 years. We then came back to Singapore and then from Singapore, we came home to England. It was while we were in Singapore that we were in a meeting with Chinese men and women in a house. And a stranger came in. No one knew him. He was from South Africa. A man who was dark-skinned from South Africa. He walked in and joined us. And that was amazing. It came to the near end of that meeting. And the leader of that meeting, that prayer meeting, said, Tom and Edna are going back to England. They've served the Lord abroad for so many years, and now they're going back. So we must pray that God will reveal to them where they should go, into what area of the world. And suddenly, this complete stranger, tall African, said, I must pray for them. So they yielded, and he came across and he started to pray over us. And then after praying so wonderfully for us, he moved into prophecy, from prayer into prophecy. Your feet are to walk in lands you've never walked before. 
You are to take my word in the languages of the people. Notice that plural. In the languages of the people. You will stand before government rulers and royal princes and judges and you will declare to them my word. You will be opposed. You will be obstructed. It goes on than that, but it finishes like this. But I, I am with you at all times. Fear not, be faithful. That was an amazing prophecy. Edna and I then got home to England and uh, my wife and I, when we come to crucial decisions, though we pray together about them, I go into my room, my bedroom, and she will go into a room, and then we separately call upon God and ask God to speak to us. And do you know, as we came together, we both had the same portion of scripture that God spoke to her, in separated from me and me from her, the very same scripture. Here it is. This is what the Lord says to his anointed, whose right hand I take hold of, to subdue nations before him, to strip kings of their armor, to open doors before him so that gates will not be shut. I will go before you and I will level the mountains. I will break down gates of bronze. I will cut through bars of iron. I will give you the treasures of darkness. Riches stored in secret places so that you may know that I am the Lord. And that is why in my book, I've written my dedication. I dedicate this book to the treasures of darkness, the riches stored in secret places. You may never be able to read this book or even know that it exists. But the Lord, your Abba, Father, knows every one of you and you are precious in his sight. For you have embraced his son, Jesus Christ, Isa, as your Savior and Lord. And you love him with every heartbeat and fiber of your being. You have also lived with the possibility that every day could be your last one on earth. A separation from your families whom you dearly love, who also will suffer. This causes you deep pain. In the word of God, we are exhorted to honor those to whom honor is due. And each memory of you moves my heart and causes me to bow humbly before our Heavenly Father in your honor. My voice lifts in thanksgiving for your faithfulness and your fearlessness, even unto death. I cannot list by name the many of you whom I have baptized secretly to become followers of Christ. But I know with assurance that we shall meet again in the presence of our great King Jesus. I repeat the words of an old English hymn describing that wonderful day when he cometh when he cometh to make up his jewels, all his jewels, precious jewels, his loved and his own. He will gather, he will gather the gems for his kingdom, all the pure ones, all the bright ones, his loved and his own. Faithful children, faithful children who love their Redeemer are the jewels, the precious jewels, his loved and his own, like the stars of the morning, bright with crown dawning. They shall shine in their beauty, bright gems for his crown. I am your brother in the eternal bonds of Jesus Christ. So my book is dedicated to them. Some of them have been our sons and daughters and they've been martyred for Christ. Yes, they've paid the ultimate price. Unashamedly, but they have been martyred. And you would know who have martyred them. There's no me for me to publicly say who, but you know. However, I thank God for them. Now, the first journey, it came to be, uh, we had an invitation to come to the Middle East, to Lebanon, which was at war at that time, and to come. And uh, the letter was a lovely, gracious letter. We've heard of you, Tom Hamblin, and, and your wife. We invite you to come over to Lebanon to the Bible Society of Lebanon because we believe you're the man who would carry the word of God in Arabic and other languages from Lebanon, from Cyprus into the Arabian 
whole peninsula and Saudi Arabia and Oman and all the other countries and Yemen around. Eleven in all. And we knew that that letter was from God. We knew it was inspired of God. And we moved to the Middle East. By, but we lived in Larnaca because we had a big storehouse, nearly as big as this church, with tens of thousands of Bibles in many languages. And it was then that we had to move them, transparently, openly. So the first uh, came, the first journey for me to take, it was to a country where there's no Christian churches and there was no freedom. And so we got up to the uh, check-in desk, and as we got there, Edna was beside me. She couldn't come with me. Only the male could go into that country. You had to wait six months before you could get your wife in. So she couldn't come, but she saw me off. We were in a queue, people behind, and one man in front checking in. My, my, he was just 10 kilos overweight, and he was charged 50 US dollars. And I looked at Edna, she looked at me. You've got over 120 kilos, yes, I know. Have you, <laughs> have you got any money, Edna? Oh, yeah. So there we are. And as we're checking in the boxes, one after the other, the dear girl behind says, you have a lot of luggage, you know. You have a lot of luggage. You have to pay a lot of money for this. And she kept moving them off the scales. And off they went, and they, they were on the other side. And I said, yes, but I said, you know, those are holy Bibles. I said, are you a Christian? I'm a Greek Cypriot. I know you're Greek Cypriot, but are you, I'm a Greek Orthodox. Oh, I see. So you're Orthodox Christian. Yes. Ah, yes, I see. Well, I'm a Christian too. And those are God's holy books. They're the Bibles in languages. And I told her, please, I said, well, you, you, I'm sorry, $3,000 you've got to pay. So I said, well, I haven't got it. <laughs> So she, she, she then went to the next girl and they whispered and they went on their calculators and she came and she said, $2,000. I said, I haven't got that. And look, look, I said, I opened my wallet. Look, that's how much money I've got. I, I said, I would never give that money to, to my wife, $2,000. She'd spend it. Oh, she so, so, so. had a little bit of a laugh. Then she looked at how much, I said, you see how much I've got? I said, I've got enough to pay for a hotel for one night when I get there. And I said, so I haven't got... That's all I, so she went to the girl again. A thousand dollars. So we've come from three to one thousand. Lord, you're working this out. This is wonderful. <laughs> Do you know I love God's arithmetic? That's terrific. His arithmetic is wonderful. <laughs> so I then said, um, can I see the supervisor, please? I'd like to speak to the supervisor. Well, he will charge you $3,000. I said, let me speak to the supervisor. And I was expecting that through the door, the supervisor would be a Greek Orthodox man. I'm in Cyprus, after all. And they're Greek Orthodox Christians. So, But the man that comes through is in fly, flowing white robes. And he's an Arab. What's the trouble? What is this trouble? I said, sir, your ladies are so nice, so helpful, I said, but um, uh, they're asking me for a thousand US, I never said three, one thousand dollars to, to pay excess baggage. I said, I, I haven't got that. Well, what are they? I said, they're the holy books of God. They are the Torah, Zubur, Psalms, and Injil, Gospel. In these books, yes. So he looks at the girls, he says, huh? Uh, no, no, never mind, he said. Let them go on the aircraft. He's, he'll only have to bring them back. <laughs> and I felt like saying, you don't know my God. You don't know my God. I'm in obedience. I wanted to say, I'm in obedient to my God in obedience, and I'm going with this word. However, they all went on board, and I was up in the aircraft, and I said, Lord, now it's over to you. You've done the first miracle, and you know, Lord, I've got to land in this country where there's no freedom to worship you, no churches, so now it's over to you, Lord. It, really, Lord, and I was reverent, really, Lord, it really is your problem, not mine. <laughs> so, so, and I was reverent. We landed, and when we got there, or I got there with the stuff, I'm unloading for as it was coming through on the, you know, the belt, and I'm loading into me two trolleys as I, I'm doing that, and this big Yorkshireman's there, and he says, Hey, hey, mate, he said, what on earth you've got in all those boxes? You see that sticker on them? That's Arabic. Immediate search. Immediate search. What on earth have you got in your boxes? I said, Holy Bibles. 
holy Bibles. He said, blimey, that's worse than whiskey. <laughs> I said to him, it's better than whiskey because I said, this is the Holy Spirit. This is the real spirit. <laughs> all due respects, all due respects. He said, where's my case? I don't want you to be anywhere near me, he said. He grabbed his case. He ran he, with his case. Oh, it was so amusing. So off he went and I had my two trolleys. So I pushed and I pulled and I came up to the two customs officers. Open your boxes. Certainly. Started to open them. What are they? Yeah, the holy books of God. <laughs> the holy books of the true and living God. And one went like this. He stepped back, didn't touch it. And the other did. He took it in his hands. The true injure? Oh yes, it's the true Isa? Jesus, yes. It's the true injure. And he opened it. And you know, it's at those times you say a little prayer, Lord, not Revelation, not the book of Revelation. <laughs> Please, Lord. <laughs> Let it be the gospel. Let it be the gospel. And I can say in 16 years of evangelizing, 16 years doing this, every time every one of them opened it, it opened to a gospel. It opened to a gospel. That in itself is miraculous. That in itself is the workings of the Holy Spirit. Our God works in the most wonderful ways. So he's reading. And he says to the fellow who backed off, Look, he said, it's Isa. Isa is speaking. Isa speaking. It, it, this is the true gospel. I'm going, he said, to get the director of the airport and the police. You're going to be arrested. You shouldn't have brought them here. There's no churches here. There's no Christians here. I said, there's no churches, but there's many Christians. And this is their word. This is God's word. So off he goes to get the director. And he's read the true angel. Yes, of course it is. Where, how long are you staying? Well, I said, maybe one week, two weeks, maybe. Where are you staying? One night only in a hotel. First night, hotel only. So I told him which one it was. Okay. Go, go. Now, I'm English, of course. As you know, I'm English. But I'm not stupid. He was saying, go, go. Do you think I was going to say, well, don't you think we should wait for the director and the police? Don't you think? Not me. He said, go, so go. <laughs> and I didn't look back in case I became a pillar of salt. I went with that. I went. And of course, when I got to the hotel, they all had to go in the lift. They all had to go upstairs. They all had to be packed into my bedroom. It was amazing. But then, you see, the workers there were saying, is that the, is that the holy Indian? Is that the Bible? Yeah. Oh, can you spare? So, well, that was the first journey. That was the first journey. They weren't all as easy as that. Some were a bit more difficult, but... Um, I hope to share them with you if I can find my notes. Uh, so pray while I find my notes. Notes, notes, where are you? I've put you somewhere. Ah, maybe here. Well, if you're not here, I just speak. Ah, no, it's not that one. However, we go on. Right, that was the first trip and it went wonderfully well. What do I do then when I get into a country where there's no churches, no freedom for Christians, and where it's against the law to bring in the Bible? What, what do I do? What do I do? From that hotel, I made contacts. I had one, actually, the first time. And I rang up, made the contact. I'll come. I'll take some of the boxes. I'll store them for you. Then every day, I walk down the main streets where the big hotel five-star hotels are and lovely shops and I walk along in strong transparent bags so everybody can see I've got the holy books in Arabic and I'm walking along and people are saying I can hear them behind me hey look see you ask him no you ask him so excuse me is, is that the uh, Bible? Is that the Holy Bible? Yes, of course it is, in Arabic. Oh, I would love it. I've wanted to read the Injil. Well, it's there. It's in the, it's here. And so on the street, I'd hand them out. And then I would walk into a hotel, because in every hotel, there's a coffee shop. 
There is, every hotel has a coffee shop, and you find in these Muslim countries in Arabia, it's always the men, the Arab men are drinking coffee. The, the wives are all working at home, but the Arab men spend hours. So I would deliberately slow my steps as I saw a group of maybe six, eight, or ten. I'd slow my steps and say, Salaam Alaikum. And then they'd see me, Alaikum Salaam. Hey, hey, hey. Uh, where do you come from, America, uh, Britannia? Oh, Britannia, I said, I'm British. Ah, come here, friend, come here, friend. What is that in your bags? Oh, I said, it's the holy word of God. It's the Torah, uh, Zabur, Injil. You bring it here? How, how much? No, no, it's no money. No money? No, it's free gift. If you desire to know the truth about Jesus Christ, the Son of God, you want to know the truth? Yes, so hand them out, they're all eager to have, and then they start reading, and it was wonderful because I'm still with them and I'm drinking coffee, of course, and I'm with them, and then they're starting to shout to one another. Isa says this, and they read out what Isa said, <laughs> and then it's going across this way, then it's going that way. You know, it's amazing, absolutely amazing. On one occasion with one group in the hotel coffee shop, a man gets hold of me and says, I must speak to you privately, privately, please. Certainly, I said. So he takes me away on one side, and we go to, towards the gent's bathroom. And I think, oh, dear. So he said, uh, <laughs> you know, privacy, <laughs> privacy. Uh, so we go in, and uh, there was nobody in there. Lovely, it was beautiful basins, and everything was beautiful. Look, my friend, and the tears were rolling down his cheeks. My friend, I have been waiting for over 20 years for a copy of... The Torah, Zabur, and Injil, my friend. Look, he said, let me give you this thousand US dollars as a gift. No, I said, no, I can't even take one dollar because God has told me to give these as gifts and they're free, they're gifts. And you have been waiting for over 20 years for the gift of God. There it is, you take it. He hugged me, he hugged me, he held me. It was absolutely wonderful. I never saw him again because going into different countries, they're not always there, of course, not the same people. But nonetheless, that's the way I was doing it with open bags, open transparent bags. Well, I went into another city with my transparent bags and I needed to get some local currency. So I went to the bank. And I got in the queue. Now, the banks in the Middle East, I tell you, you there's no proper queues. They all are clambering at the counter. It's a real... Suddenly, the manager behind the counter, he sees me. Ah, you, uh, are you a priest? Fancy saying that. <laughs> I, and I thought, Lord, he won't understand about the priesthood of all believers. He won't understand. So, uh, yes, I am, I said. Well, I am, aren't I? Yes, I am. Everyone is. Yeah. Everyone who becomes a Christian, a child of God, you're a priest unto God. So I said, yes, I am, yes. Ah, oh. well, he said in the bank, I am an empty Muslim. I am an empty Muslim. What can I do? Well, I said, what you can do, and I lifted it up, you can read this. Read this. This is the Injil. You can read about Jesus, the Son of God. You have that there. Come, let him through, let him through. So I went through all the crowd up to the counter and I handed it over to the manager. Muslim gentleman took it, kissed it, opened it, and no sooner he opened it, in my presence before me, he turns to the tellers and all the others behind the counter. Look, he says, look, it's the real Injil. Isa is speaking. He'd gone into the Gospels. It had opened to the Gospels. Isa is speaking. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And of course, as you know, Islam denies that Jesus is the son of God. But now he's reading. God so loved the world that he gave his only son. And whosoever believeth on him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Those are the kind of experiences that I had but I didn't expect this one to happen in another big city where there was a couple of churches allowed for Christians only one was Roman Catholic and one was an English church and that was from history in the past they were allowed but only those that were not nationals they couldn't go in 
So I'm in that country and I'm moving down the main street with my two bags and there's this beautiful ladies shop with all the lovely dresses in the windows and so on. And as I'm passing by, there's a big entrance, there's nobody in it, nobody coming out, nobody going in. But as I'm passing by, the doors opened. And the Holy Spirit said, go into there with my word. It's a man, it's a, a female shop, uh, you know. Go into there with my word. So I walked into the shop and I looked around and all the ladies, of course, were in black and their veils and you mustn't look at their eyes. And so I'm doing this, looking at the floor and trying to find out which way do I go. And I'm carrying them like this, you see. And suddenly I see two Filipino girls at a cash desk. They're at the cash desk. Oh, good. Yes, I've got it, Lord. I know what you're saying. So I went over to the Filipino girls and I said, hello there. And uh, how are Oh, hello, they said. You've come to buy a dress for your wife. No, I said. She's got far too many. <laughs> so, so they said, really? I said, oh, yes, I said. And uh, are you living here? No, I'm not. My wife's in Cyprus. I said, she's waiting for me to go home. But I said... Um, I'm here, I said, uh, because I need to ask you two girls a question. What's that? Do you know Jesus and do you love Jesus? You know, they said, three weeks before we left Manila to come here, we were born again. And we became Christians. Yes, we love him. I said, great. I said, well, now, which Bible are you? Tagalo, Filipino language? Or are you reading English? Or what are you? Oh, we haven't got Bibles. We were told you can't take them. You'll be arrested and sent back. So we never came with Bibles. But we love Jesus. Good, I said. Now I said, um, I'll get you English or Tagalog Bibles. Give me two days and I'll get them for you. Okay, so th thank you, Lord. I obeyed. I did come in. So I started to move out with my... Excuse me, she said, brother. Yes. What about Arabic. I said, Arabic? Can you read Arabic then and speak? No, I can't read Arabic. But it's the women. What are These women in the shop with all their robes, when we're folding up the dresses to put them in bags, they lean over and say, can you get the book of Isa? Jesus, can you get the book of Isa? Oh, I said, how many? I mean, one or two women? Many women keep asking, can you get the Injil? So I said, okay, that's fine. Two days, I'll be back. But now, are you prepared to take this 10 kilos from this bag? 10 kilos in this bag, 10 kilos in the other. Would you take 10 kilos? And if you have any of these women come and whisper that to you, give them a copy. But no one else, don't just give them everywhere. Please, you'll be in problems. Don't do that. Only if a Muslim lady asks you. Yes, okay. So they took it. I go back two days later, and I have Bibles for them. The two girls, they're very happy to see me. And I've got bags with me. And as I go up with two, and I said, well, uh, did any ladies ask of what I gave you before? Come round. So I went round the counter. There's the bag. Looked in the bag. Two copies left. All had gone. All had gone. Now, what does that reveal? What does that reveal? What it reveals is there is a deep hunger and there has been a deep hunger and thirst for the word of God, the true word of God, for decades. For decades they've been waiting for the word of God in the Islamic Middle East. They've been waiting. And so, of course, I was so thrilled. I said, you, you never... No, no, we only gave it to those who are... Well, I said, would you like another 10 kilos? Yes, they said, we'll have another 10 kilos. So I gave another 10 kilo bag, took their empty one. And they said, oh, wait a minute. We've made a list of other ladies' shops. Filipinos are working. And they've got these women all asking for the Book of Isa. They're all asking in these shops. You'll need a taxi to take you around the city. So I went around all these women's shops. <laughs> I might tell you I was the only man in them. <laughs> There's only man in them. And it was amazing. Yes, please bring them. So that was one marvellous period of distribution in that city. That city, of course, was eventually invaded. And there was a, 
a lot of damage and so on. But nonetheless, it was a window of opportunity, and I took it. Now, there was another country where, again, no churches at that time. They've allowed one to be built now, or two, in fact. But at that time, there was none. And there was one man who always opposed me. In fact, I gave him the nickname Mr. Fanatic because he really roasted me every time. I had great difficulties, but I was totally open and honest. And uh, my, my Bibles would be confiscated and put into a store. And that leaves you with this alternative. You go first to the director of the airport. And if he says no, then you've got to go to the next government minister. If he says yes, that's fine. You can get them out and take them with you. Once he said yes. When I went on another time, he said, I'm sorry, I can't do it again. I can't do it again. You see that man out there sweeping? Yes. He's spying on me. I said, he's a sweeper. And you're the director. I know, but he's spying on me. I can't do it. You'll have to go to the Minister of Censorship. You go to the Minister of Censorship... Yes, we know the three books are holy books, Torah, Zabur, Injil. They are holy books. But no, we prevent them from coming. No, sorry. You'll have to go to the Ministry of Information. Now, that's getting higher. Very high, in fact. The Minister of Information. And you, when you approach these ministries of information, you must get past the guards first at the entrance. Then you must get past all the secretaries and all those that are doing clerical work. You must get to the door, which is his office. You must be polite and nod at people, and they're all asking after you, what do you want, where are you going? And you nod, and salam alaikum, alaikum salam, 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 salam. And so you move on quickly. And that's what I did, and I got right to the door of the Minister of Information. And I went in. Oh, he said, where are you from? I said, from Britain. And what are you doing? Well, I said, I'm a missionary, really, and I'm giving out the word of God freely. Oh, and what version, what is it? He was very educated, and he was very interested. So, yes, he said, I see. And uh, that's your paper. Yes, I said, they're all confiscated. I need to get them out. Yes, all right. Here you are then. I'll sign it. He stamped it. Go and get your holy books. He gave it to me. And I thanked him very warmly. And he bid me well. He was such a fine fellow. So off I went and I got them out. And that was great. Then I distributed them. Oh, Lord, bless that man. Bless him, I said. But one thing he said to me as I was leaving, um, Mr. Hamblin, you're coming back again? Oh, I said, yes, about three months. I go into other countries in between. About three months' time, I should be back here. I see. And you'll be, of course, bringing more Bibles. I will, sir, yeah. All right, he said, I want you to send me a fax. And on the fax, because it was before these uh, email business, on the fax, I want you to say which languages, how many in each language, would you do that? I said, yes, I will do that. Then he said, I will approve it through customs here at this end. You do that for me. I, and Mr. Hamlin, I said, yes, sir. He said, don't fill the aircraft, please. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, boy, this man is a lovely, warm man. I was so happy about that. So the time came for me to go again. There were other things, of course, I went elsewhere in between. But the time I went back, you want to hear how that went. So I get back and I get right to his office again. And I knock the door and I open. Now, there's something lovely about Arabic culture, and that's this. If they see your face, they never refuse you. They're so hospitable. Whoever you are, complete stranger, if they see your face, they welcome you. That's one aspect which is so delightful. So he saw my face. He welcomed me in. And he had two cabinet ministers with him. I didn't know until he introduced them to me that they were cabinet ministers. So I shook their hands and so on. Uh, this is the man that I've told you about. This is the man who's a holy man of God. This is the man who brings the Torah and Zabur and Injil. He's, he's a brave man. Mm, yeah, they agreed. Then he turned on me. What about Salman Rushdie? What about Salman Rushdie? Well, yesterday morning with the men, we turned to Philippians 4, and I said, my Bible tells me not to read Selman Rushdie's book. 
I'm not to read it. Not to read it, no. But you, you in the West and Americans as well, you can read the lies and the dirt of Selman Rushdie's, uh, what's that title, Satan? Yes, Satanic Verses, that's right. You can do that, he said. So I said, no. I said, it's because I am a Christian that I cannot read about Selman Rushdie. So with that, I've got to just find the scripture, which our dear pastor had to look for yesterday as well. Where are you, Philippians? There you are, I think. These tags are all right, but sometimes they confuse you. Do they ever confuse you? Yeah, they do me too. Come on, I know where you are, somewhere. You're here somewhere, come on, where are you? Philippians, okay. No, not Colossians. <laughs> So I stood there before the three of them, and this is what I read to them. Whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, whatsoever things are this and that, whatsoever things, what, think on these things. You see, I said, is Salman Rushdie's book Pure? No. Is it true? No. Is it noble? No. Is it right? No. Is it lovely? No. Is it admirable? No. Is it excellent? No. Is it praiseworthy? No. You see, that's why I, as a Christian, will never read Salman Rushdie's book, Satanic Verses. This was the reaction. Read that again. Read that again. So I read it again the second time. Sir, I said, would you like to receive a copy? Full Bible in Arabic. I had some lovely embossed ones. I would indeed. Then the two cabinet ministers said, have you any more? Have you any more? I said, I certainly have. So I gave them as well, one each. When I went back to that country the next time, the minister of information had been removed. He'd lost his position. He was no more there. But I thank God for him. And I believe he would have been reading the word of God, the copy I gave him, and the two other cabinet ministers. I believe that. Now, a secret believer. I must tell you about a secret believer very quickly. And this secret believer, there's many secret believers. And this one contacted me by telephone because he'd been contacted in London. He'd been given a gospel and he was reading it, flying from London back to his country in the Middle East. And as he was doing so, and this was a country which was very anti-Christian, he was reading it and he was crying. And the hostess uh, said, sir, are you all right? Would you need some help? Oh, no, he says, I'm just understanding for the first time in my life. I'm understanding truth for the first time in my life. He was weeping. By the time he'd actually landed, he'd gone through that Gospel of John twice, studiously. And then he saw at the back of the, of the little book he had, he saw the, the publishers in London who, who gave these books out. So he contacted them by phone, got in touch with them. And they said, oh, we know a man. We've heard of a man who travels your way and he can meet up with you and so on. And cutting a long story short, we did. We met in the government offices. That's where I had to meet him. There were all these government ministers around and secretaries. And he was there. Ha, ah, he said. Hello. And I said, hello. You must be my brother Tom. I said, oh. <laughs> you know, you must be my brother Tom. So I went and he hugged me, took me upstairs into his office. And then I handed him the complete Bible, kissed it and handed it to him. And then he said to me, where are you going to give me my first study? Where? So I took him into Romans, to Romans 5. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God yeah, through our Lord Jesus Christ. Then into Romans 8. We had an hour, an hour and a half together as we went through these things. And when he saw Romans 8, oh, 
did he revel in it. He did weep, but he reveled in it. He fell on his knees. That's who you are. You are Abba Father. You are Abba Father. Oh, you are not Allah. You are Abba Father. Oh, what a cry. And the tears rolling down his cheek because he was out of the darkness now. And he was coming into the light of the glorious gospel. That's why. Truly wonderful. And so we had a great relationship for several months until an urgent letter came to Cyprus from him. Dear Brother Tom, Sister Edna, I must write to you and do anything I can for you now. I must do now anything you need now because I think my time is near. So I quickly got onto a flight and I flew to where he was. And when I got there, I was too late. He's wearing the martyr's crown in glory. Those you read of in Revelation 6. How long, O Lord, how long will you take before you avenge our blood shed for you? How long, Lord? Revelation 6. Wait a little longer, Jesus says. Wait a little longer until others like you have also been killed. And when the number is complete, then, then, then you read on. You read on from there. And the martyrs all over the earth, there are martyrs, Christian martyrs. You be very thankful for the freedom you enjoy. You be very thankful that you can come to such a place of worship and praise as this place. You be very thankful, be very fully committed don't only be committed on Sunday. Please don't be one of those Christians with too many in the land who only go to Sunday morning church. But prayer meetings and involvement in evangelism and outreach, they're not in it. What's wrong with so many mediocre Christians? What's wrong with them? When they know that Christ has died for them, when they know that his blood's been shed for them, when they know they've made an open confession and been baptized, why is it that prayer meetings don't attract them? Bible study, no, no, Sundays is enough. No, it's not enough. Oh, be thankful that you live freely and you have all that you need and you're in good clothes. I see some of you and you're beautifully dressed. That's speaking of women. But you men are decently dressed. But, you know, you have so much. Would you not agree with me? You have a lot. Yes, yes indeed you do. Be thankful. Be thankful and take upon your heart to pray for the Middle East. Take upon your heart to pray because the Middle East includes Israel. And we are engrafted in Israel. Romans, read Romans, study Romans. There's a lot, there's a lot of anti-Israel today, even on the BBC. A lot of bias. You are a people of God, you're Christians, then read Romans and see where you are with Israel. And God will bless any who say, peace be unto Israel. Bless Israel, Lord, today. God will bless you. And I found it such a joy to meet a messianic believer here today, a dear sister. Oh, it was wonderful to meet her this morning. That was great. That cheered me up no end. Well, now... Uh, time's always against me and it's come to an end really and yet I have so much here to share but I can't share it all now but I will say it's been a privilege to be here it really has been a privilege perhaps I should just share one short one I can't resist I can't. I'm sure it's the Holy Spirit I'm quite sure so be, be happy and just be quiet and everything else I have two passports here they're joined together this was my original and there came a time when it was so full and the last one that was put in was from the big country in the Middle East persona non grata where I was arrested and detained and even the British ambas um, ambassador who was a born-again Christian at that time could not get me out so I was thrown out persona non grata so I went up to the High Commission in Cyprus and I said to the British High Commission this is my problem I am a missionary to Muslims and I take the word of God to them but I said now I've landed in a bit of a problem and so I need a new I know it's not due renewal yet but I need a new one uh, no problem I think you do a great work he said you're very brave and so on 
Yes, I'll, I'll get you a new one. Thank you. I said, can I keep the old one as a souvenir? Well, of course you can. Well, make sure you can keep it as a souvenir. Thanks very much. Come in two days and pick it up. I went back two days to pick up my new one plus my souvenir. But what had they done? They had put the two together, fully linked and sealed. <laughs> and sealed. And would you believe it? I said to Edna, darling, look at that. They're stuck. I can't undo it. I can't get that free. It's done. Well, darling... You just have to accept it and trust that when you go into this country you're going, they don't come in backwards and see the persona non grata. Yes, let's commit it to the Lord. So we did that and then I went on the journey and as I got to this very difficult country, open your boxes, open, open. So I opened them all, there they were. Now it so happened on that occasion, a Christian mission had asked me to take three master copies of the Jesus film in Arabic. Beautiful film, beautiful. Three master copies. I never carried videos, but they pressed me kindly. And they said, oh, Tom, please, is there some place you could put it with your Bibles? It's so important because it can be copied so many times and circulated to the underground church. Yes, I know that. Yes, okay. So I yielded. Okay. Well, when, they, when I opened the boxes and they started, no, Video, no, 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 you're for trouble. These will all be destroyed. They were really kicking up a fuss, I tell you. They were kicking up a fuss. Give us your passport. So I got it out and said, there it is. There's the passport. And this is what happened. Oh, oh, sorry. Uh, diplomat, diplomat. And they started to sign all my boxes. Diplomat, diplomat. And I was looking, thinking, diplomat? No, no. Oh, yeah. Um, and I, I was very diplomatic. I kept my mouth. <laughs> and my darling Edna says, that's the first time in our married life I've been diplomatic. <laughs> The book is on sale at the back, it's seven pounds each, it tells a lot more. It's not a book on theology, but it is a book full of reality, of what God has done. And he uses vessels like an old man and old woman to carry his word. So if you'd like it for seven pounds, there it is, and I trust that God will bless you as you read it. And I do thank you, dear Pastor Mark, for taking the biggest risk of all and inviting me. God bless you.